John Gosselin has spent over a decade fighting a very public divorce and custody battle for his eight children. Allegations of cheating, abandonment, abuse, and manipulation spread in the headlines. 2008, we filmed every single day except for two. I took this amount of privacy from my kids. I'm fully aware of that. So John and Kate plus eight basically ruined your family. I, I think so, in my opinion. Allow me to set the stage here with a little YouTube history. The story of Jesse Wellens and Jenna Smith. On November 10th of 2009, the couple posted their first YouTube video, which featured Jesse pranking his then-girlfriend with a fake mannequin in bed. They didn't know it back then, but this single video would mark a new beginning to the rest of their lives. This looks like a freaking dude is in my bed! Over the next decade, the two would continue posting these kinds of pranks, building their main channel up to over 10 million subscribers, with a view count in the billions. Their second channel, Boyfriend vs. Girlfriend, is where they expanded their reach with daily vlogs meant to capture behind the scenes moments of their relationship. I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'll see you guys tomorrow. See you guys tomorrow. The goal was to further engage with their massive audience by showcasing a close, intimate look at their lives. For about four years straight, Jesse and Jenna filmed, edited, and brought broadcasted their shared experiences and memories to over 6 million people every single day. As they'd soon discover, however, dominating the YouTube algorithm didn't come without risk. I don't even know how to start this. This is probably going to be the hardest video that we've ever had to make. By spring 2016, the two had reached an impasse. As they slowly grew apart as people, issues had begun to arise within the relationship, and having to put on a happy face for the public every day wasn't helping. Daily vlogging, you think is fun and games. I'm not gonna sit here and bash daily vlogging, but I'm just gonna be honest. Like, this is the honest truth. Every couple, almost, that I know personally and not personally, that daily vlog together, it, it always burdens the relationship. Among other things, Jesse noticed they were neglecting their own relationship in favor of producing non-stop content. On a podcast, he stated, It was great in the beginning, but then it slowly polluted our relationship and made it toxic. I just felt like we were doing stuff for the vlog and not for our relationship anymore. And you start losing focus on like, what am I doing? Am I doing this because I love her? Or am I doing this for the video? Like that's toxic for any relationship. They then decided to take what would become an indefinite break, both from daily uploads and ultimately from each other. It's just too much. It's just too much. Daily vlogging's too much. We need to take a break. These were two people who genuinely just wanted to entertain their fans, but having to constantly maintain and curate an image, pretending things were always great when in reality they weren't, only exacerbated already existing problems. Because having to perform to an audience in your own home every waking day can put a massive strain on interpersonal relationships, and isn't always the healthiest lifestyle for couples or families. When the success of your show is reliant solely on filming your children, for instance, things can go south fast. Maddie, what, what would you want to say about how you and your sister and your family are doing? Um... Maddie, your words. Was it sometimes hard to tell where the family ended and the show began? Oh, absolutely. There got to points where I was pushing camera crew out of our house. To have them come out here to do a big magazine article, to have them come on national TV, does it kind of continue the injury to them? I mean, there is no injury to begin with. Now I understand why. All she wanted was legal custody to film my kids. John and Kate Gosselin dominated cable TV for years with the help of their eight children. Becoming one of TLC's flagship programs, the family at one point was earning the network a staggering estimate of $10 million per week 
week. Regular people enjoyed getting a glimpse into the Gosselin's chaotic everyday life of raising eight kids in the suburbs of southeastern Pennsylvania. But after a couple of years, controversy defined the family's legacy, with allegations ranging from infidelity to child exploitation buzzing among the tabloids. It was here that the first cracks began to form in John and Kate's less than perfect marriage, marking the start to a nasty public divorce that took the country for a ride and left the children stuck in the middle. If you guys hadn't done that reality show, do you think your family would be intact? The pressure of, of being in front of the whole world and, you know, every mistake you make is, is, is out there. I think that was a big influence of them not being together, and I definitely think they'd still be together. But before we go any further, I do want to thank today's sponsor, Aura. Have you ever Googled yourself only to discover a ton of your personal information already existed online? I have, and it's scary. I didn't like it. But unfortunately, data brokers don't care and are making a fortune selling your personal information to robocallers, spammers, and anyone else who may want to know things like where you live, your name, your numbers, stuff you definitely don't want strangers getting a hold of. Luckily, Aura can identify these threats and submit opt-out requests on your behalf. After all, brokers are legally required to remove your info if you ask them to. They just make it annoyingly difficult, so let Aura do it for you. Getting to work immediately upon signing up, Aura works to remove your name and personal information from malicious sites. It's really easy to set up so you don't have to download several different apps to get things like parental controls, antivirus, VPN, password management, identity theft insurance, and more. You get everything at one affordable price when you click the link down below or go to aura.com slash today to start your two week free trial. It both helps the channel and prevents people from exploiting and profiting off your personal information. So I, I don't know what you're waiting for. Huge thanks again to Aura for sponsoring this one and making sure our data stays safe and secure. I just want to direct. All day. Is it their time to throw a bottle of water at me? Thank you. Okay, alright. Alright, got it. You're really, really mean. Be quiet. Katie Irene Kreider was born on March 28, 1975 in Philadelphia to her mother Charlene and father Kenton, a pastor. Kate herself didn't exactly come from a small family, being raised alongside four siblings of her own whom she reportedly stopped talking to once she became famous, according to her sister. Yeah, I don't know. Familial drama is something that kind of goes hand in hand with Kate Gosselin, so just get ready for a bumpy ride here. But before rising to reality TV stardom, Kate was a registered labor and delivery nurse in the small borough of Wyomissing, Pennsylvania. And through a company picnic in October of 1997, Kate was introduced to Jonathan Keith Gosselin. I was working in a hotel. I was living with my mother at the time. I had just graduated which is, from nursing school. There was this guy walking across the grass and I wasn't really looking for anybody because I was very self-sufficient. But he caught my attention. You had sunglasses on, I couldn't see your eyes, but he looked like that matter. I was like, I'm not leaving here today until I meet him. I declared <clears> that <throat> fact. Had you dated a lot before you met John? I had a girlfriend at the time. I she told was, her. She was gone the next day. <laughs> Getting married in the summer of 99, Kate would become pregnant only a few months later through fertility treatment, as polycystic ovary syndrome left her unable to conceive any other way. Nonetheless, Kate gave birth to a healthy set of twins, Maddie and Kara, on October 8th, 2000. And after a couple years, John and Kate decided they wanted one more. But this time, the fertility treatment worked a little too well. I mean, however you want to put it, Kate became pregnant with not one, not two, and not even three, but six babies. All at once. To give you an idea of how rare that is, doctors estimate the odds of having sex tuplets are about 1 in 4.7 billion. And to make it even more insane, no case of sex tuplets in the United States has ever surpassed 31 weeks of gestation. Kate gave birth at 30 weeks. As a result of being born almost 10 weeks early, all six babies were delivered by a team of more than 75 medical personnel and needed to be placed on ventilators immediately. From the very beginning, people everywhere were invested in the Gosselin's medical miracle. In her book, Kate writes of journalists breaking down hospital doors and hundreds of volunteers lining up to offer their assistance. Even their house got renovated by the NBC reality show Home Delivery as a gift to make room for the now family of 10. 
It's not hard to imagine how overwhelming this new life must have seemed to John and Kate, who were, at the time, both unemployed and still just in their 20s. Kate has gone on the record numerous times, describing the depression she felt following her delivery, the frustration John felt being unable to find a job, and the overall financial burden they all felt during this difficult time. In their defense, they weren't exactly expecting to be blindsided with sex tuplets, and even with the generous donations they received, the Goslins could barely support the two kids they already had, let alone six more. But all that would soon change, thanks to a single email from a TV executive. Uh, this wonderful man contacted us. His name is Bill Hayes. And, and his philosophy was he does TV to help people understand each other better. And I couldn't argue with that because at that time, we just wanted people to understand us better. Yep, and, and we want the best for our kids, so we will do the absolute best necessary for them. As the parents of eight kids, two five-year-olds, and six 16-month-olds, John and Kate Gosling must stick to a very strict daily routine. While their babies were just a year old, they were featured by Discovery Health in an hour-long special titled Surviving Sex Tuplets and Twins, with a second special airing the following year. Much like our friends the Duggars, Discovery was absolutely testing the waters with the Gosselins to see if there was anything there worthy of a full-blown series. And sure enough, with these two specials garnering such high ratings came the launch of John and Kate Plus 8 in April 2007. For the first two seasons, Discovery reportedly filmed the family three to four times a week. To put the sheer scope of everything into perspective here, season one debuted at eight episodes, while season two contained 12. <laughs> you might, you want to guess how many there were in season three? Just, just guess, okay, I'll give you some time. Yeah, 31! <laughs> the filming really kicked into high gear after they moved over to TLC, with season four boasting a shocking 41 episodes in total. Over the course of just the first five seasons, John and Kate Plus 8 had featured an impressive 115 episode run. In February of 2008 alone, barely a year after the show first premiered, the Gosselins had a full camera crew in their house every single day but two. I remember one time, uh, February, I would say February 2008, we filmed every single day except for two. I never got to points where I was pushing camera crew out of our house. These kids' childhoods were completely intertwined with reality TV almost from the second they were born. And while this sadly isn't an uncommon occurrence today with family vlogs on YouTube, the difference is this happened so long ago that we can look back and gauge what kind of effects this invasion of privacy really had on the children that were affected now that they're all of age. In fact, coincidentally, while I was working on this video, a documentary from Vice came out in which Hannah and Colin described a bit of their experiences working in reality TV from such a young age. As Hannah outlined, I was used to being filmed. You're just being filmed while you eat breakfast or while you eat lunch. With Colin adding, you just don't register the fact that they're there. Someone else wakes up in the morning and does their daily routine. They don't think it's crazy. They think it's normal. So that's kind of how it was for us. It was normal. There were definitely times where I would wake up and I would be like, really? Is it necessary? Do the cameras have to be there, there were definitely times where I wanted that day off. I don't have any clear memories before the cameras were there. But in fact, it wasn't just the TLC camera crew filming on their fifth birthday party, for example, as the children were outside playing on bouncy castles, trying to have fun being kids, paparazzi could be seen hiding in the bushes, trying to snap some pictures of the party, as John and Kate were nearing the height of a very public feud that would become central to the show's success. So John, there's been a lot in the press here lately. Um, can you clear the air and fill us in on what's going on between you and if the cute birthday parties and wholesome activities with the kids got you in the door, it was the tumultuous state of John and Kate's marriage that kept you watching. As TMZ's Harvey Levin described it, watching a woman push a wagon full of kids up the street is just not interesting to me. But then, when it started to unravel, it became interesting in a different way. Many viewers noticed that as their love for one another faded, their relationship began taking center stage on the program, which meant getting a front row seat to their entire marriage going up in flames in real time. You go out to the field and then you come back and then they weigh your apples and then that's how you, they determine cost. But that's where usually everything John, works. they don't, they know how you weigh apples. Oh, honey. It's okay, it's all right. 
All right, I'm not talking anymore. No, 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 no. Just as TLC had no problem filming the kids in their own bedrooms, at the doctor's office, in the bathroom, getting potty trained, the network would also happily broadcast the most uncomfortable moments of John and Kate's personal disputes. And I'm playing with Leah and showing her all these different animals. And then she's like, come here, come here, come here. Hello, I need your help. We're done. I've been looking for you. Go to 11. Go to 11. No, I can't. Would Why? you come here? Because you need to stop playing toys oh. and come help. Bye. You stand here. Stop I have yelling. to go ahead. And everyone looked and I got embarrassed. So I went up to the front and I stayed where she told me to stay. I was stressed. I didn't I'm want playing them with to the see it. That's fine. I'm playing with the babies. And then I hear, Hello. We're over here. You told me to stay here. Come. This is for going pee potty. I'm not talking to you anymore. This is good for going pee potty. It's great. Okay, you need to pay attention. No. Verbal altercations they'd frequently have in public, in front of their children and production crew. Even all these years later, I still cringe every time Kate says something like this to John. She was probably, I'm sorry, can you stop breathing so loud, honey? He's like, <sighs> Breathe quietly. This kind of thing was constant and depicted them each in very specific ways. In her essay, Professor Mary Frances Casper writes, reducing 30 to 40 hours of filming into a one hour episode allowed producers to tailor viewer perceptions of the couple. Kate, a self-described perfectionist, was shown as a critical, demanding taskmaster who ruled over her home with the will of an iron. John, on the other hand, appeared inept, indecisive, unfocused, and sometimes surly. Throughout the constant bickering and snide insults hurled between parties, it was usually John at the receiving end of what I'd consider pretty unjustified cruelty. Since we had to buy from Maddie and Karen still, we set up another chip where it was just Kate, myself, and Maddie and Kara. We went to the mall. Honey, don't ramble. Like, say it in five rambling. seconds. I'm sorry, I was just trying Just say to Maddie and Kara had to get each other something, so we took just them as she was usually the one to start fights over seemingly nothing, bossing him around. At the corn maze and our show open, you yell, hello. And he stand up and help them in, they're having trouble. Hello. Screaming at him in public. And I don't care what he says, we've never been in a store where I yelled across the store, hello. Yes, we have. When? Crayola factory. John! John! Potty, you have to sit with them. That was not a store. Making fun of his weight? A little worried about your workout situation if you're shoving all baked goods in your mouth. You've eaten constantly for five or six years. You can insult me all you want. You've called me fat for the last three seasons. As if we live our life by seasons. He is so, so, I don't know what the word is, but that is just tacky. All she does is make fun of my weight. So now I'm doing something about it. I could care less. It's past the weight. We don't live in terms of seasons. You could say the last three years. That yes, would be better. Last don't use seasons Nine in years. terms of- I mean, your kids are gonna see this one day. I don't know, John, why don't you tell us? My, he's awful quiet today. I kind of like it, actually. This is actually pretty much what it is like talking to him. Did you hear me? Did you hear me? No, he didn't hear me. See, that's what it's like. Surely there has to be a better way to resolve these issues. But because this was all televised, that was never the point. For the network, the drama meant numbers. With season five premiering to over 10 million people, a record for TLC at the time. The Gosselin strained marriage was the cause for rampant gossip fodder among shows like The View and made for countless headlines plastered across shitty tabloids at the Walmart checkout line. In fact, John and Kate appeared on more tabloid covers than any other celebrity from March to October 2009. Even the CEO of Figure Eight Films, the studio that produced the show, acknowledged their crumbling affinity for one another in a Vanity Fair article around that time, claiming you could see the friction in their relationship from the start, with TLC president Eileen O'Neill adding, we had a show that was rising in interest based on the unfiltered, sometimes cantankerous relationship of this couple with these eight beautiful children. And as journalist Nancy Jo Sales illustrated, often the production team would go to John and Kate into discussing their disagreements during their weekly couch sessions. And oh boy, those were sure fun. Why do you speak to each other the way that you do? Oh. Kate, why don't you put him in the back seat? Listen, I have eyes everywhere. I can watch. Oh yeah, okay. I think we're very honest with each other. 
Don't, please don't squish the cereal in your not anger. not squishing anything. It's you're the same not, with you. You're not that honest, though. It takes me a while to get that out of you. Like, the real reason why didn't you do that? No, that's the way I am. But anyway. I'm kidding. They weren't fun. They were painful to witness. And Lex didn't like it. Oh, she didn't? Yeah. Why don't you just interview? Since you were there. I was guessing. Excuse me. Well, that's ridiculous. Oh, gosh, I'd hate to steal your spotlight. Go ahead and talk. I think it's abundantly clear now that John and Kate were just becoming two very different people. I feel like I personally have the ideal job. I'm loving what I'm doing at this time. John Close feels somewhere. frustrated. Yeah, so... But you're working from home, and I feel like that's the greatest thing in the world. She does, but that's not me, so it's like a conflict, and it sticks with you. I mean, we have it's to live in not... the public now. I'm happy our show is popular, or whatever it is. Um, but it's hard being on this side of the camera mm -hmm. and not just sitting here. I mean, that, that's the easy part. It's going out in the world and trying to live your life and people see your life as episodes and you see as a date on the calendar. And it's just, I mean, we don't have privacy at all. If I go out, people know I go out and photograph it and do everything they got to do to do something about it. But that's tough for me. I can't be John, I have to be John and K plus eight, which is a real hard thing for me. And I still haven't come to grips with that yet. I think recently, I think the thing you currently are struggling with is the fact that we can now never go back. We're kind of at an odd place. I don't know. So don't we know have some say. ironing to do. I mean. One unnamed employee who worked on the show claimed that as time went on, John lost his identity. He was like, look, I don't like this fame. I hate this. And Kate was like, it's funny. I hated the fame and now I'm liking it. She was the star. John acknowledged on the show that she was the one who had the writing, the books, the career. This is a classic story of people growing apart. It didn't help that John was also beginning to have suspicions of Kate cheating on him with her bodyguard, Steve Neal, as they traveled around the country together on book tours and speaking engagements. A claim that she has vehemently denied. I speculate, but I don't know, John told Good Morning America, describing his perspective of having to watch after the children at home while Kate made all the media rounds. When they were traveling together, I felt jealous. Here I'm Mr. Mom, and then there's some other guy traveling with my wife. But it wasn't until October 2008 that Kate allegedly approached John at the kitchen table and told him to his face that she had grown out of him and no longer wanted to be with him. According to both a source close to John and John himself, Kate supposedly uttered the words, I don't know why I married you in the first place. It came all from her. Yes, yeah. She wanted a divorce. She asked me, she didn't want to be married anymore. It was out of the blue too, because I was sitting at the dining room table and I was just like, what are you talking about? She's like, I'm done. I don't want this anymore. You know, you don't want to film. You don't want to go along with uh, my plan and filming and the kids and this and the house. And I'm like, nope. I don't. And this is where our tale starts to get dicey. Because you have two different people spinning two different narratives as a part of a very public media battle against each other's character. It was very much a war of optics, with John claiming Kate initiated their divorce, while Kate insisted the opposite, and that she never wanted to separate. Telling People Magazine, John has been asking for this for a long time. He does not want to be married to me anymore. No questions asked. He went and hired a lawyer and said, you'd better get one, so I did. I never would have made that step. I never would have done it, but I did because he told me to do it. The anonymous source close to John also alleged that John was the one trying to keep them together, as he suggested they both go to counseling. But the only counselor Kate would agree to seeing was none other than Dr. Phil, which according to this source advised the couple during a private session to stay together to keep the brand intact. John was like, are you crazy? I'm here to save my marriage and you're talking about my brand? Kate confirmed this meeting in fact took place, but refused to discuss the details, while Dr. Phil himself apparently denied commenting when approached by Vanity Fair. When you get into the weeds like this, it becomes genuinely difficult to verify every claim made when there isn't direct proof of a lot of them. So it just takes certain things here with a grain of salt. I know it's frustrating, but that's the unfortunate nature of John and Kate's story. Just an unending back and forth of he said, she said blasted to millions of gossip-hungry fans forced to take sides in an active media frenzy that completely disregarded the privacy of everyone involved. It was gross, it was messy, and at this point, it was far from over. This is your first television interview. By myself. By yourself. In four years. So what does that mean to you? 
Uh, I think I can get a lot off my chest. She doesn't speak from the heart, I speak from the heart. And I think I can get a lot of truth out there. As the story goes, John and Kate were sleeping in separate rooms by the end of 2008. John residing in a guest room above the garage, lonely and unhappy, according to a friend. Going out to bars, Kate claimed he had been staying out till 2 a.m. I knew it was just a matter of time before somebody in the media caught on. But it wasn't until February 2009, when John was visiting his mother in Huntington, Pennsylvania, that he attended a beer bash put on by college seniors, with photos apparently being published in the school newspaper of John Gosselin playing beer pong with the the women's volleyball team. Sadly, couldn't find the pictures, but I did find this testimony from one of the team members who told the star he was acting like a drunk, girl-chasing frat boy. It really disturbed me. On the show, he was so nice, but here, he was acting like an idiot. Again, all alleged, and to this day, John maintains that he never once cheated on Kate, despite it becoming a very popular notion that spread throughout the media, especially after these pictures of him surfaced with a 23-year-old teacher named Deanna Hummel. Her older brother, Jason, only adding more fuel to the fire by insisting their affair had been going on for three months, telling US Weekly she's a nice girl, not a homewrecker. He is a bad liar. This isn't healthy for her, but she's refusing to help herself. So here I am trying to help her myself. I hope this clears the air. Adding that John would come over to their house and pretty much stay locked away like two teenagers. Then Jason gets weirdly personal by telling the magazine he could hear them having sex in the next room. Quote, a lot of the time it was pretty, um, gross listening to her. You know, um, how do I say this? The walls are thin, let's just say that. I mean, no one wants to hear his sister having sex, let alone with a married dude who's like almost twice her age and who has eight kids and a maybe crazy wife? Ick, nasty. Nah. <laughs> okay? Deanna has responded by telling people, my brother is making all of this up. He has no credibility. I can't even stomach the lies he's saying about me. John echoed this sentiment by maintaining that Deanna was nothing more than a friend. It was the picture that changed everything. A late night photo of John and 23 year old third grade teacher Deanna Hummel leaving a club but America's dad denies that he was caught with another woman that was just my friend I just hung out with her you know not a girlfriend no doesn't her brother say that you were fooling around with her of course doesn't her brother get paid Everyone gets paid. Then shortly after, towards the beginning of season five, the couple officially announced their separation to the public. Curiously, the same day that episode aired, John and Kate had both met with attorneys to finalize an actual divorce. They were over by this point, but the show still had an entire season left to produce. So while John was seen out with all these women, the show was still depicting him as Kate's husband. According to him, this was done to trick the public and make him out to be the villain. The reality was they had been separated for a long time. Time. I was portrayed as the villain because Kate asked for the divorce. The network needed a reason um, to explain to the public what was going on. So uh, she asked for the divorce in 2009. I left the show. There was nine months hiatus. Uh, we were already divorced and then the paparazzi started taking pictures of me dating other women and all this stuff. But on TV, it was shown as me being married. So the public was being fooled uh, because on television, I'm married, but in reality, I'm already divorced. In fact, Kate's own brother, Kevin, even went so far as to claim she offered John a whole contract that would have allowed him to see other women just as long as he still showed up to film the program. Kevin and his wife, Jody both maintained that John and Kate were separated for months before it was announced to the public and that they were only pretending to still be together for the cameras and to appease TLC. All we know is what John has told us, that Kate came to him a while ago with a contract stating that he can have girlfriends and that he can do his own thing, that they will live separate lives and um, they just need to continue the show. Right. In exchange, John needs to show up for filming, basically is what it's saying. John needs to um, be there when the filming is going on, but otherwise he has the freedom certain days to do whatever he wants. Meanwhile, all this did was give the paparazzi something to do. After John started making constant headlines, anywhere from around four to 17 paparazzi would be camped outside their house at any given moment, following Kate and the kids around on errands, to school, on trips to the beach. I always tell the children, turn your backs and don't look at them, don't speak to them, Kate told Vanity Fair. I don't even let them use that word. I mean, no five-year-old should be using the word paparazzi. Yet for the Gosselin children, 
children, this was still their reality. These five-year-olds didn't choose it, but they were robbed of anything even resembling a normal upbringing, thanks to their parents, whose rocky personal lives were keeping the tabloids in business during the 2008 recession. Literally. These kinds of photos were much easier and cheaper to produce than your typical story on Brad and Angelina or Kim and Kanye, who were way more out of reach than some random family in Pennsylvania. Nancy Jo Sales wrote that In Touch magazine sold close to a million copies of one title featuring John on the cover, with Us magazine sales booming from 600,000 to well over a million just by running stories on the Gosselin's divorce. And a writer from Star claimed it was one of our biggest stories of the year. It also wasn't uncommon for publishers to pay inside sources for valuable information. And during a recession, that money looked pretty tempting, which only muddied the waters as to how accurate all this stuff even was. But what we do know is that the police were called in August of that year after the couple were hurt in a verbal fight. All because Kate didn't approve of the babysitter John had hired during his scheduled time with the kids. No charges were filed, however, it did become a point of contention in the media. I just, first I want to say, I'm trying to understand what happened first of all, because I, I'm getting a little bit confused because if it was his turn with the kids, turn with the kids and he hired someone. Was it someone that you knew and you knew you didn't like, or how did it was what this happened? girl that's in this article? And okay. it was, um, I had never met her. I still have never met her. Right. And I didn't approve of her because what I'm telling you is my intuition was saying no, no, no. Right, but and I didn't know why. So I understand that. But when you help go into a custody thing right. with someone, and you have your specific time and their specific time, and you're not supposed to walk on. And I'm sorry, that's the law. But the ultimate question on everybody's mind became whether or not the show would continue even after the couple went their separate ways. So what happens now? Are you and the kids going to do the show? John is out? I, I don't, I'm not the person to make that decision. I know that myself and the kids will continue the show. Well, if, the, if John says, I don't want to do it anymore, I don't want to be part of it, I'm divorced, I don't need this, will the network say it's you and the kids? That will would the, be a question for the network. Will the name of the show change? That would be a question for the network. And if they said, forget it, that would be okay with you? And if they said, we'll continue, that's okay with you? That would be their decision. So why are you letting the network run you? While John was off, separated from Cade in New York, TLC decided to move forward with the program. Only recent events called for a total rebrand to just Kate Plus 8, which was announced in September of 2009. At this point, Kate had gone from being largely despised by audiences to admired for her sheer will to persevere as a single mother of eight, while John became looked at as a deadbeat dad who walked out on his family. He now admits that he kind of went off the rails during this six months immediately following the divorce, regressing to his 19-year-old self and making headlines every other day. In late 2009, he even confessed to dating the daughter of Kate's own plastic surgeon. I mean, this stuff was wild. She says he borrowed $200,000 from her, and now she wants it back. You can pay me back civilly through our lawyers, or I could take you to court, and the judge can give you a court order to pay me back, and then you could spend more money on your lawyers. You know what that is, John? That's Carmen knocking at your door. Meanwhile, Kate was undergoing a massive PR makeover of her own, ditching the famous spiky bob that had turned into a Halloween costume for a longer, glossier look. Her appearances on a variety of talk shows had done wonders in humanizing her. And for once, Kate was demonstrating an emotional side of herself that the country felt it could sympathize with. John, however, stayed on the defensive, culminating during an interview with Chris Cuomo where he revealed that he despised the mother of his children, which brought him even more negative attention and even prompted some pushback from Chris. Despise? I despise because she's not speaking from the heart. Please, the stuff you tell me in private should be the stuff you tell me on TV. Please. You gotta be careful about how you talk about Kate as the mother of your kids. Maybe it's unfair, but the mother of your child is not supposed to be criticized. Either is the father. Yet yeah, the plan was for Kate Plus 8 to make its official debut that November, at least until October, when John filed legal action against the network, attempting to get the new show and his kids off the air before it even started, putting a sign in front of the family's house warning TLC crew members that if they set foot on the property, he'd have them arrested for criminal trespassing. This, however, put him at breach of contract, which led TLC to countersue for violating his duty as an employee 
making paid and unpaid appearances on talk shows, and making unauthorized disclosures to the public. His lawyer, Mark Heller, claimed that a pending investigation by the Pennsylvania Department of Labor and Industry would prove TLC violated child labor laws, which it did in fact hold true the following April. According to the state of Pennsylvania, the kids' participation on the show added up to work and were deemed to be employees, which meant they needed work permits according to a resolution agreement from the state's Bureau of Labor Law Compliance. They uh, didn't have those, so technically the state could have pressed charges, but didn't, as long as they promised to never do it again. <laughs> you can violate child labor laws a little bit as a treat. Regulators said in a letter sent to the producers last month that no action will be taken on two conditions. At least 15% of the proceeds from the series has to be put into a trust for the children and child labor permits must be obtained for all future filming. But like everything regarding this family, the legal battle was complicated. Kate and TLC blamed John for rewriting history, claiming he only wanted the show gone now that he was dropped from the branding, while he and his attorney insisted that John wanted what was best for his kids. He didn't think it was appropriate for them to be on TV anymore, and even expressed regret for his initial decision to have the show in the first place. Sure, it made them money at the time, but he ultimately wanted to give them a real childhood, as their son Colin went on to emphasize years later, telling Vice just recently, I think my parents had very, very, very different perspectives on TV. My dad really understood that he wanted his kids to be able to live a normal life and have a normal childhood, to the point where he'd reportedly bankrupt himself trying to cancel Kate Plus 8, all while the network paid for Kate's legal fees, according to him. I I've spent $1.7 from when TLC sued me and my divorce. Kate, on the other hand, TLC paid for her attorneys in the lawsuit and for her divorce. So I financed it by myself, and she was financed by the network. Meanwhile, their divorce was officially finalized in December 2009, giving Kate the house along with the full legalized custody of the children, while John was granted shared physical custody. And as the lawsuit with TLC ended in a settlement, John agreed to a gag order, meaning he couldn't appear on or speak publicly about the show for the next 10 years. And because the kids would still be featured on K Plus 8, John had very limited time to spend with them. He couldn't be on TV, which is where the kids usually were, making normal co-parenting practically impossible for the couple. This began to drive a wedge between John and his kids, as for the next several years, he rarely saw them all together at one time. Unfortunately for Kate, though, the show was cancelled in 2011 for low ratings, which was absolutely devastating considering that up until that point, Kate had practically put all of her eggs into the reality TV basket. Nonetheless, she'd still cling on to that celebrity status by any means necessary. I'm freaking out big time. My kids weren't ready. Nobody was. I've never quit a job in my life without having something else lined up. This has been ended for me on a moment's notice. I don't know what's next. Kate refused to stay away from TV throughout the 2010s, with appearances ranging from The View to Celebrity Wife Swap to Celebrity Apprentice. And I really feel it's your time, Kate. You're fired. Most famously though, Kate appeared as a contestant on the 10th season of Dancing with the Stars, where she'd make headlines both for her less than desirable dance skills and the cloud of drama surrounding the experience she had with her partner, Tony Davalani, who she would regularly berate just like she did to John. I love how you teach, but you're not taking into consideration how I learn. Can you just show me? We don't have enough time. I'm not stressed. Really? Then why don't you start paying attention to my teaching then? Like, I just want to learn. Like, like, show me so I can get it. I'm done. I'm done today. Tony, I always felt bad for you. I always felt bad for you because you got stuck with Kate Gosselin. Did you have to take a long vacation after that experience, Tony? <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot of therapy involved. Yeah. <laughs> See, Kate's public image was starting to turn a once again, this time for the worse, with all her new reality TV appearances leaving a bad taste in people's mouths, including John, who around this time attempted to get primary custody of all eight children, slamming Kate as an absentee mother as evident by her stint on Dancing with the Stars. But Kate was determined to prove to the world that her kids were totally safe in her care and actually loved being in the public eye. During this, a horribly awkward interview that she dragged her 13-year-old twins onto in 2014. Now let me just say, it didn't exactly put the public at ease. Kate, Kara, and Maddie Gosselin are with us now. Good morning to all of you. Good morning. Well, we have not seen you or gotten to talk to you two in a long, long time, and you're out because you want to let the world know that you're doing okay. Maddie, what, what would you want to say about how you and your sister and your family are doing? Um... 
Maddie? Your words. No, it's, it's your hard. Chance. It's a hard question. Oh. What about you, Kara? <laughs> So this is their chance to talk. This is the most wordless I've heard them all morning. Yeah. I mean, they are so visibly not interested in being there, first of all, but they also looked absolutely terrified of responding in a way that may have gotten them in trouble. Um, I, I, I don't want to speak for them, but Maddie, go ahead. Um, sort of the things that you said in the magazine, that years later, they're good, they're fine. Go for it, Matt. It's your chance. No, you just said it. Oh, I said it. It just looked like Kate was searching for a very specific answer that neither of her twins wanted to give for whatever reason. Well, let me ask you this, girls. I mean, to go out and be in People Magazine to say, hey, we're doing okay, why did you feel you needed to say that? Do you think people had the wrong impression of you guys, Kara? Kara. <laughs> My gosh. What Kara yes is or thinking. No. <laughs> go for it. The interpreter. Oh, wait, wait. Well, what? what is she thinking? Do people have the wrong impression of you? Oh. I wouldn't say wrong. I would just say not like the full like story. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people like think that um, filming like our show has damaged us, but it's only really helped. It's not really done. They're damage. more aware of what is out there, the, you know, inaccuracies, things that are said by the general public, their father, whoever in general, because their friends talk about it at school, so I sort of am forced to kind of inform them, and um, I think the most upset, we talk about it a lot, and the most upset they are is because they get really frustrated that people assume certain things in our house. And they always say, but that's not how it is, mommy. Why do they say that about us? Now, it's genuinely troubling when this is how they're reacting to a simple question about their safety and fulfillment. Would you guys want to do another TV show if you could? Yeah. You would. You could, because it was fun or because you like kind of having your lives out there on display? Oh, you want me to say it? Okay. <laughs> um, I wasn't sure if you were going to say something there, Kara. Anyway. <laughs> Um, it was, it was fun. I really miss it. And you do too, Kara. Kara does. She's just not going to say it. It's <laughs> a lot of fun opportunities. But nonetheless, by the time 2015 came around, K Plus 8 was back. Renewed for a brand new season with all eight kids returning. Uh, well, hang on a second. Somebody's missing. Colin wasn't there. You can't do anything without realizing he's missing. Each unique child is receiving exactly what they need. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, when a kid disappears under mysterious circumstances with no explanation, it's always a good thing, right? Unfortunately, Colin's story is pretty heavy. And I do want to go ahead and issue a trigger warning here, since we will be discussing allegations of abuse and neglect. So feel free to skip ahead to the timecode on screen now if you'd rather not hear it. It's a mommy and a baby bear. It's supposed to be me and you. Oh, well, where's everybody else? Colin Gosselin wasn't too different from the rest of his siblings. He'll tell you now that he wasn't always the easiest toddler to put up with, but then again, he didn't act out more than any of his brothers and sisters did. Telling Vice, I was definitely one of those run wild kind of kids, but there was just this point in filming where I was like, I don't want to show up on camera anymore. I was quiet. I would sit there and just be completely silent in interviews or not interact or not do what I had to do, which I personally think is pretty understandable and something to expect from a young child who otherwise spent such a huge portion of his childhood in front of a camera. Maybe it's possible he didn't want to be interviewed by TLC producers that day. Maybe he wanted to play Legos without some crew member pointing lights and a microphone in his face. It's just something to consider there. But one way or the other, his behavioral issues were something Kate struggled to contain. So he was shunned from the rest of the family. With his sister Hannah Gosselin also telling Vice, he would be separated from us. He would not get to come outside and play with us. He would eat dinner at different times than us. I don't think effort was made in the home to help him learn what behavior is acceptable and what behavior is not acceptable. As a possible explanation, Colin theorized that Kate was just using him as an outlet to express her anger and stress, stating she was going through a divorce and plenty of other different things that can't be easy to go through. And you know, I want to think that she needed someone to take out her anger and frustration on, and it was just kind of me. Whatever the case may be, Kate inevitably landed on the decision to quietly ship Colin away. 
I was in two inst two different institutions. Um, scary place. I was actually 12 when I got admitted there, and then it was like I spent my 13th and 14th birthday there. Why were you there? Because your dad said you shouldn't have been there. One afternoon in 2016, when John was visiting his kids for lunch at school, he happened to take note of Colin's absence, asking the rest of the kids where he was that day. The table fell quiet. Frantically, John turned to the school counselor for answers. It was here, through a complete third party, that John learned his son Colin had been withdrawn from the school. Kate hadn't told him about this. In fact, she hadn't even told him he was gone, or most importantly, where he was. No one, not John, not even the children had any clue as to Colin's whereabouts but Kate. John said that he has no idea where Colin is and that he has not seen him in a year and a half. He claims that you won't tell him where Colin is. We are both court ordered not to speak about the care and custody of our children in detail. I've known all along where he is but the world doesn't know and I'll leave it at that. John's in that world. If Colin is watching this interview right mm -hmm. now Maybe he is. What would you want to tell him? Just that I've been actively looking for you, and right now I'm just going to go back to court, and your mom will tell me eventually um, if it's court ordered. Going to court and filing subpoenas, however, led him nowhere. Legally, he wasn't owed any information on Colin. Sadly, John was left hopelessly in the dark until a very peculiar day in June 2017. Kate says that Colin is in a special school for special needs kids. Behavioral problems. That's what she, she tells the press. You know, my mom had her own agenda. I don't know exactly what that was, but my agenda was to make it out on top of that tough spot. Being secluded at the Fairmount Behavioral Health System, Colin miraculously managed to scribble a note in black crayon and smuggle it out of the facility and into the hands of his father, letting him know where he had been the past two years. As the note reads, Dear Dad, I'm not trying to trick you, but I still love you. I told Mom I want to live with you. She said no, but right? She can't choose for me. I'm old enough now. I'm your son, not hers. She was abusive to me after I left your house. I'm sorry. Take this to court. Adding, I'm I'm counting on you to get me out of here. Fairmount, Daddy, I love you. Before listing the address of the facility and concluding, please come fast. I love you. Help me. Bye. John was alarmed, but so was his daughter Hannah, who, upon finding all of this out, refused to go home to her mother, expressing a desire to stay with John, who immediately filed an emergency petition to modify custody over Hannah, who moved in with her father shortly after. But then there was the question of Colin, who had apparently been relocated to Pittsburgh after all this time time and remained traumatized and in a horrible spot mentally while in the hospital. Recalling it, being in an institution, it took a toll on me mentally. It was a really, really dark place. All I had was myself. I didn't have anybody else. I had no support system. It was scary. I was confused. I was lost. Throughout the entire two years he spent there, Kate never once visited him. Off doing her own thing on Kate Plus Aid, having the time of her life, not having to deal with Colin's so-called special needs. The reason she she now cites for institutionalizing him. Except, as it's since come out, Colin had no official diagnosis of anything. There were no actual special needs that anyone could pin down. That phrase in itself doesn't even carry specific meaning. This was all just a way for Kate to cover her ass and come across as a responsible mother in the media, while the real reason behind Colin being sent away may be a lot darker than she'd want us to believe. When asked by Vice as to why he had been sent away in the first place, Colin responded, I was starting to tell my teachers that, you know, my mother was, can I use the word abusive or are they not allowed to use that on air? To which the producer asked for clarification, are you trying to say your mother was abusive to you? Colin answering, well, yeah, that's kind of the reason she sent me away. Throughout this interview, Colin alleges that it was only after he began telling others of Kate's so-called abusive tendencies at school that she made the decision to effectively get rid of him and avoid taking any accountability. I was starting to tell people what was going on at home, and, you know, she caught wind of that. It had to put me somewhere where I wouldn't be able to get the secrets out, he stated. Uh, it's important to note that Kate has denied this across the board, defending her decision to put him in a facility because of his psychiatric diagnoses that she doesn't specifically name, and claims that the decision to admit him was made by emergency room doctors following one of his many attacks and outbursts, this one involving the use of a weapon 
in. Fast forward to the present day, following John's removal of Colin from treatment, my son's unpredictable and violent behaviors have sadly continued regularly toward John, Hannah, and others around him, she claims. Additionally, Maddie Gosselin, one of John and Kate's twins, has also made some accusations of her own against Colin, claiming that he has physically threatened her along with every member of their immediate family, adding that I will never allow someone who has exhibited hateful and even violent behavior towards others based on their racial identity, gender identity, or religious beliefs to be in my life. Uh, this hate speech allegation specifically is an interesting thing to point out, considering it's something we haven't yet heard or seen from Colin at this point in public. Yet Maddie insists that Colin has made his opinions very apparent in private, stating there is no further conversation to be had about rebuilding relationships with anyone in my life after reaching the point of physical violence and hate speech. To which John responded with, it took courage for Colin to sit down and speak about his past, and the last thing I would have expected was more abuse to come his way from a sibling that hasn't seen or spoken to him since he was in sixth grade, before then directing his words towards Kate. Regarding these brand new false accusations, it seems clear that even today, after not seeing her son since the sixth grade, Kate is unable to control her abusive words towards him. Kate posting cruel, false accusations regarding Colin it seems to be just another way for her to justify her inexcusable, horrific past behavior toward him. True love for a child wouldn't include a mother attacking their son in public. Adding that Colin is away training to become a Marine and is unable to issue his own response at this time. Colin had to be cleared by the Marines with a full background check, including mental, physical, and medical clearance through the U.S. Marine Corps, he claims. The government's full diagnosis clearly reflects the truth. At the end of the day, I absolutely hate speculating on all of this, especially because some of it doesn't feel like it should be public at all, but we're at a point where several of the Gosselins have publicly accused each other of varying types of behavior in the media, leaving the public unable to verify the majority of it. We don't know what goes on behind closed doors, so we just have to evaluate each individual accusation as they come. In fact, I think now is a good time to mention a dispute between Colin and John that happened back in 2020, resulting in John needing to put Colin in a therapeutic restraint. Colin got out of the car, Hannah was yelling, I was like, come on, I just gotta go to work, go back to work, can you guys just calm down? And uh, Colin got upset and he threw, I don't even know what it was, a piece of plastic in my car or something. And then that elevated me a little bit more because I'm already in a hurry. He got in my face, he tried to like push past me and I had to do restraint on him. Is this sort of like hugging them tightly or? Yeah, it's more holding their arms or just keeping them from going in any position, but it's also protecting you. So like they don't punch you or hit you or any of those kind of things. And have you done this before I came yeah. in the past? So he knew it was coming? Yeah. Okay. So it's nothing you want to do as a parent, though. It's because the emotions afterwards, you're just like, what did I just do? And like, why am I doing this? And was the right thing then you start second guessing yourself but it's already done after colin called the police and made a worrying instagram post an investigation soon determined that john's so-called abuse towards colin was unfounded colin has since expressed gratitude towards his father for teaching him resilience and is doing better than ever after moving in with him in his own words which is all to say that the inner workings of this family are beyond complicated we'll never know every personal detail of their lives and frankly we shouldn't but we can at least listen to the testimonies given by those involved. And it is especially worth noting here that the things Colin has said about his mother in particular do unfortunately align with some of her old journal entries that hit the headlines a decade prior. Colin, if your bear has gum on and it's going in the trash, I'm not getting it out. That's ridiculous. I'm throwing this bear away. I'm not, I'm not dealing with it. I will teach him to get gum on stuff. Your bear's going in the trash. Say goodbye to it. Yep. Kiss him goodbye. Because he can't go through the dryer anymore. Me Sorry. We bears play together every morning. It's too bad. John. Wasn't his fault that he got gum on his bear? It probably fell out of his mouth when he was talking. We don't chew gum when we're three. Too bad. He can't go through my dryer without ruining all the other clothes. I'm in the public eye. I've been investigated many times. It's always unfounded, obviously. So they're all unfounded? 
Yes, absolutely. See, Robert Hoffman was a writer who covered the Gosselin story during the 2000s, and through John, was given a discarded journal belonging to Kate that she had supposedly tossed out after the divorce. This journal contained a myriad of passages dating from 2005 to 2007, as Kate wrote about her experiences as a new mother of eight children. In her own words, it depicted both the good and the very bad of her parenthood. While it did contain a lot of innocuous writings, some of the passages in here specifically seemed to outline some pretty horrific treatment that she'd inflict upon Colin while he was still a toddler. Hoffman then published these entries in a book titled Kate Gosselin, How She Fooled the World. But because the information was technically obtained illegally, Kate sued, and the book was promptly dropped from all retailers at the time, though Hoffman never backed down, standing by the legitimacy of these entries. One legal document that came from the lawsuit described under factual allegations that John Gosselin obtained access to Kate Gosselin's digital journal by making a digital copy of her entire computer. Hoffman then published large excerpts from Kate's copyrighted journal in a book, which was published through the large online distributor Amazon.com in 2012. Kate then dropped the lawsuit a year later, only after the book was pulled from shelves. It's now back on Amazon though, in case you were wondering. But throughout this entire process, Kate never once denied the authenticity of these passages. So just keep that in mind as we move forward here. In an entry dated September September 5th, 2006, Kate described an instance of her being too rough with two-year-old Colin, writing, Today, I was officially a horrible mommy. I failed all the way. I was absolutely awful to Colin, who was awful to me. He does things just to irritate me. I told him at one point to sit in the corner one of a million times, and he disregarded me and threw the one gate on the floor. I am too rough with him, and the girls see that. I feel so guilty that I treated him like that, that I will set out tomorrow to be a better mommy. I need to pray for my relationship with Colin. I can't explain it. I love him so much, but I don't understand him. I don't know what he wants a lot of times. He just starts shrieking and I tend to ignore it a lot. He is such a sweet boy and so cute and smart, but I just don't understand him. Now it is clear that Kate was dealing with a lot of frustration here, but to say a two-year-old is only doing things intentionally to irritate you is dangerous. But it gets even more concerning from there. After Colin apparently knocked over some high chairs, spilling beans all over the floor, which pushed Kate to a point that she feared she might seriously injure him. This time writing on January 2nd, 2007, I let the kids play for the first time in the water table that had beans in it instead. Colin decided to pour the beans all over the floor while I was inside peeling potatoes. So the girls told me and I sent all the offenders inside. Well, Colin didn't like that I sent him in, and when I was out in the garage, I heard three large bangs. I went inside and three high chairs were on the floor, literally. I was in instantly so, so angry that I grabbed him and spanked him as hard as I could and thought I may seriously injure him. So I sent him to his crib and whipped him into it very hard. I, for the first time, thought I may really lose it and I'm glad that I just let him in his crib till John came home. I have never felt that I may really seriously injure a child, but today was that day. The third and final entry we'll look at is one dated May 16th, 2007, when Colin was just three years old, a time in which she grabbed Colin by the hair and spanked him so hard she scared herself. Today, I think I crossed the line, with the kids always sort of fine until nap time. During nap time, Alexis and Joel trashed their room twice and were spanked both times. They had to stay in their beds for a long time, and when I allowed them to come down with everybody else, five minutes later they were into the M&M's, potty training rewards, with Colin, and I really, really lost it. I pulled Colin up by the hair and I spanked him so hard. I loved them so much much, but I was so angry with them. I put them back in their beds for their safety, and I have apologized many, many times, but I still feel very, very guilty. I love them, and I saw my dad in myself today, and that really scares me. So I recently read this incredibly upsetting article that uh, argued that, and this, I think it was just quoting a therapist saying that, uh, that Kate had zip-tied your son to a chair in order to prevent him from being wild. Your response to that claim? That's true. I mean, it's true. Th that is his words to a therapist that had to submit a report in court. And that's how I have custody of my son. So it's did a court appointed therapist and that, you know. Did you ever see her zip tie? I, ha I haven't witnessed it, but he said it multiple times in multiple situations. Um, CYS has investigated, but the kids that live with Kate don't say anything. 
coming up. John hasn't spoken to six of his kids in years. Will that ever change? He reveals his hopes for them today. It may have taken years and over a million dollars worth of John's own money, but by December 2018, Colin's custody was fully signed over to his father, in part because Kate literally failed to show up to court. As of today, Kate is now working as a nurse once again after obtaining a new license outside of Pennsylvania, and in 2022, it was reported that she had withdrawn $100,000 from both Colin and Hannah's trust funds back in 2019, citing living expenses, buying a $750,000 lakeside home that same year. She also insisted at least at the time that she was only borrowing the money, yet years later, John has claimed she's never paid any of it back, so glad things are still going well on that front. John, on the other hand, continues to work as an IT specialist and DJ on the side. Hannah shares a YouTube channel with her boyfriend, and Colin is reportedly going into the Marines. John has also assured the public in recent years that while his son has struggled, he has also been given regular access to a team of therapists, which is hopefully a better fit for him than the psychiatric ward he was secluded in for years with no visitors. It's upsetting to hear how to this day, Colin has absolutely no relationship with his mother whatsoever. The two haven't spoken in years. Even after Colin flipped his car in a near fatal accident last year, not Kate, not a single one of his siblings reached out to him. But as Colin told Vice, I think my mother drove a social barrier between us. Obviously, I see the story a different way. I really, really hope one day that we can reconnect and put the show behind us and just be siblings again. Take back the time we didn't have. None of us decided to be on TV. We didn't get the choice. It was our parents' decision. There's no denying John and Kate are both responsible for taking privacy away from their children. But as time marches on, it's been John who has taken more accountability for the conditions that he, in part, inflicted upon his family. As Hannah now states, I understand why they did it. It was a good opportunity, but it turned into something nobody saw it turning into. What started with a desperate family taking advantage of an opportunity during a difficult period of financial strain ended in one of the most tragic examples of what constant exposure to the public can do to a crumbling marriage and eight children who were never given the choice to make this their lives. Colin and the rest of the sextuplets really have no perspective on what life could be like without the media making a spectacle of their every move. And if nothing else, maybe the story of John and Kate can at least be a warning to anyone else who might have otherwise made the mistake of trading their private privacy and interpersonal connections with fame. All I can hope now is that one day, every one of the Gosselin children can regain the trust and tranquility they were once so deprived of. I think the kids need to talk. If you want to talk to the public because you're public, you have every opportunity to do those things. I would like to know their insight as well in a deeper, emotional, specific way, when, whether it's written or televised. Keep on, keep on it.